So today, the title is Wisdom to Walk. Um, I'll give you the text we're looking at. It should be in your bulletin. 1 Kings chapter 3 is where we will start. Uh, we'll have a little bit in Proverbs 8 as well, and then Ephesians 5 is where we're going. So 1 Kings 3, Proverbs 8, Ephesians 5, and I'll give an indicator when we're getting there so you don't have to try and keep your thumb in three places, but that's the order we're progressing in. So we've been talking about sin, we've sort of been defining sin, what is sin, how do we deal with sin. Last week we talked about bad habits and sort of ways in which we can break or or, uh, work with bad habits to improve our tendency to sin, shall we say. Uh, And today we're talking about sort of the next step with that. We're talking about wisdom. This, This will be a little bit of a reminder or a refresher for those of us who were here when we went through our series through Proverbs uh, and actually all the wisdom literature, uh, Songs of Solomon, no, not that one. Ecclesiastes. We need to do that one, though. That's a good one. Ecclesiastes and Job, we went through all three of those. Um, So, have you ever heard someone say about someone or maybe about yourself, he doesn't know any better? It's a thing we say usually about um, a younger person or someone who has mental issues. That is probably the two brackets I would say we say that about someone where we kind of give them, we excuse them for certain behaviors or certain things they say or whatever it might be because, well, they just don't know any better. And so we'll give them a bit of grace in this area. And sometimes that's good. And sometimes it's an excuse. Because grace is good but also there's teaching. Also, there are ways in which to work with people and to help people to no longer be in the he doesn't know any better category. Because that is a category, but it isn't the only category. So today we're talking about maturity or how to grow up out of that category. Growing up is moving from not knowing any better to knowing. Or else people will say about you when you grow up, you should know better. Have you ever heard that one before? When you do something or say something and someone says, you should know better than that, right? And that's the same category, but now it's said out of shame instead of said with grace. This idea that there is a way to be better than you are and somehow you're not there yet. And that's what we call maturity. Another phrase that I'm sure you've heard before, back when I was young and stupid, Maybe it's something you've said. Maybe it's something you've heard said. I, I hear this all the time. People talking about things they did when they were, oh, that was back when I was young and stupid, right? And then they tell me this grand story about some ridiculous thing they did or some skidoo trip they went on and they fell through a bunch of ice and it all snowed over or whatever. Crazy stories out there, right? About things that people have done and all that, and that was back when I was young and stupid. And there's sort of two ways you can say this or two ways you can hear that someone is saying this. One is... Well, that was something that I did, and, and I sort of excited to tell you the story about this thing I did, and, and it sort of gave me something, but now I know better. And sometimes we tell stories about things we did back when we were young and stupid, and we regret the fact that we did them, right? There's something that we wish we would never had done, and we wish we had known better back then, but now we know better, and looking back, we realize that was something I never should have done or said or gotten involved in, and that was back when I was young and stupid, and I did that thing, and if only someone had told me, or if only I had listened when they did. So do we say it with revelry, or do we say it with shame? Do we wish that we still didn't know any better now, and we could keep carrying on? Or do we wish wish we had known better back then? There's this, um, uh, what's it called, a juvenile correctional institution, is is what they call it, which is jail but not jail, right? Um, Because... There's this young and stupid clause in our laws, right? That if, if you're of a certain age, then there's still, you know, you're not a, a menace to society and need to be locked up for a hundred years or whatever the laws are. But you still have room to grow, room to learn, and you made a mistake. And so we're going to give you a little bit of leniency and not put you in, in grown-up jail. We're going to put you in your own special 
category, right? This is sort of something that is an understanding built into our law of some extent that it's not only your fault, but it could be something else is involved. Um, so this isn't something that is just exclusive to Christianity. This is something we hear all over, something we deal with all over, something we know about. And we call it grace. This is the fa our favorite part when we talk about the gospel. When we talk about the gospel, we love to talk about the grace of God. But see, grace is the beginning of a story that doesn't yet have an end in my own life, right? In each of our own lives. Grace is the beginning of that journey. It's this idea or this the picture, the scene, right, of Jesus on the cross. And what does he say? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. Give them grace. Why? Because they're, they're still young and stupid. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're getting involved in. They have no idea what this is all about, so forgive them. And as we accept and receive that forgiveness, then we start a new journey. We start a new way of life. We start the walk of Christianity, where we learn to, uh, as Paul puts it, die to ourselves daily, to put to death the things of the flesh and to come to life in the things of the Spirit. Just as Christ, after he said those words, he died in his own flesh and then was risen up in the Spirit. A new way to live, a new way to be, a way to be mature. See, grace does not actually deal with our sin. We'll have to say it in that way or talk about it because it's easy, right? You have sin, a sin issue, but God has taken care of that because he's forgiven you and he has he's given his grace to you. But see, that doesn't actually deal with the sin. It forgives the sin. If we have a continual sin pattern and someone forgives us every time, that doesn't actually fix the pattern. It just forgives. So what do we do? How do we progress past that with God? and help these patterns sort of get better. That's what we would call wisdom. See, there's one way of accepting the grace of God and sort of abusing the grace of God, as Paul puts it, where, you know, you don't receive the grace of God and then continue to sin because that's not the way it's meant to work. You receive the grace of God and then you choose or you, you walk in a way that is better than that because of the grace you've been given. And we don't do it by ourselves. We do it through the Spirit of God in us. We talked about laws a bit last week. Now laws are sort of there as a, a guideline to keep us on the straight and narrow. But also they're, they're not the only thing that can do that, right? Knowing that you have a bad habit and knowing that it's bad doesn't by itself stop you from having that bad habit. It's something we need to work at, something we need to do something with in order to progress. The existence of a law does not all of a sudden breed maturity. So it's not that it, when someone receives the grace of God and becomes a Christian and we sort of lay out the law and say these are the Ten Commandments or these are the, the ways in which to walk as a Christian, people go, oh, now I'm aware of what I would no longer was aware of, and they automatically become better. No, it's a process. It's a continual step as, as we learn and as we grow and as we, as we get filled with these things. And how many of us have done something that we do know better about and realize, I shouldn't have done that, right? There's always a way to refine, to grow. So that's what we're talking about. In First Kings chapter 3 is where we'll be starting. And this is a scenario that Solomon is in, where he knows he's way over his head, right? He knows he's about to deal with something that he doesn't have any idea how to deal with. And instead of saying, I can handle this, I can figure it out, I can muster through it, I'm going to be the king, what I say goes. I'll just make up my own rules and say that's the new law and everyone has to do that. Instead of doing that, he realizes there's someone far greater than him who does know the way things should work, who does know the best way to manage people, the best way to encourage people to be better today than they were yesterday. And so he petitions to this fellow that we call God, right? 
First Kings chapter 3, starting at verse 5. It says, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love. And you have given him a son to sit on his throne today. That's a funny way to talk. I never talk about myself in the third person, but in this respect, that's what's happening. Uh, verse 6, Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or how to come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you've chosen, a great people so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. So give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this great people? And it pleased the Lord that Samuel had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. And indeed, I give you a, a wise and a discerning mind. No one like you has uh, been before. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, all your life. No other king shall compare with you. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked then I will lengthen your life. So Solomon was young. He fell under this quote-unquote young and stupid clause, and he knew it. And to me, that is the first indicator that he was wiser than he thought he was before he asked for wisdom. Because he was wise enough to know I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm going to ask for help. Some of us don't do that. I mean, he was the king, but he realized every king has an advisor. Every king needs help. And though we're not kings, maybe we're kings in our own mind. Whatever we are, whoever we are, sometimes we need to realize we need help. Whatever it might be, from whoever it might be, we're running into something, we realize, I don't know what I'm doing in this area. I need someone to give me some direction, give me some wisdom. And that's what Solomon does. Sometimes we need to step back from a problem to see it clearly, get another perspective. We can't deal with our own weaknesses on our own. Sin is not solved inside a bubble. So let's say step one, if you want some some steps to this. Step one is to admit that you don't know everything, and that might be the hardest step of them all. Step two is to ask for wisdom or counsel and help, and then step three is to listen to the wisdom, and I would say that's the second hardest step. The easy step is hearing what someone has to say. The hard step is, first of all, realizing you need help, and then listening when they talk. In verse 14 here, gives an indicator there. It says, if you will walk in my ways. If you will walk in my ways. He says, I'm going to grant you wisdom. I'm going to give you the guidance that you need. But it's all going to mean nothing unless you walk in my ways. Because I can tell you things and you can hear them, but are you actually going to listen to them? I would describe listening as acting upon what we have heard. We've heard something, now we do something with that. So God gave wisdom the ability to hear, a far greater ability than anyone else, to hear all this wisdom from God. But then he told them, but it's your job to listen. I can tell you all sorts of things, but unless you listen to those things and you walk in the ways that I am wisely commanding you or instructing you to walk, it's going to be for naught. And as we know from Solomon's life, he started out listening and then he continued to hear and 
stopped listening as time went on. And he says this is the key to a long and to a healthy life. To listen when you're given advice. Doing foolish things that are unhealthy for us and those around us is not only young and stupid, but it's the key to keeping us young and stupid. Because eventually they'll catch up with us. Either we'll be living a miserable life or we'll live a short life because we went and did something we definitely shouldn't have done at our age or at any age and we paid for it. Even though there is grace, and that's the starting point, there are still consequences to what we do. There is still the natural order of the way things work. As I said, grace forgives sin, but grace doesn't actually cure the problem. Curing sinful patterns is only done through wisdom. The most perfect wisdom is wisdom of God. Learning how not to get into situations or why not to do things in a certain way is the first step. Because we all have things we get involved in. Some are good things. Some are bad things. We all have things we do. We all have things that take up our time. But only through wisdom can we discern the difference between these things that we're doing. Because we can get busy, can't we? Isn't the first thing that someone asks, they say, how are you doing? You say, oh, I'm, I'm busy, right? And that's considered to be a good thing because everyone needs to be busy. Everyone's busy doing something. We all have things we're doing. So how do we discern whether the things we're doing are what we should be doing or not doing, especially if they've become normative in our life? If they've become a pattern or a habit that we just happen to do and don't think about it, we can't easily for ourselves discern whether this is a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing I do until we get an outside perspective that either it's good or it's bad or it's whatever it might be. For instance, to take an example that I've heard from various people here that some people say about how they can't wait for the weekends, they can go and, and drink and party and whatever and, and lose their mind. That's a pattern of life. It's a habit. And it's something that from the outside we can see is it's pretty stupid to do, right? It doesn't solve anything. It doesn't deal with anything. It wastes money. It ruins whatever it is. Your heart, your lungs, I'm not a... Anis can tell us what it actually does to your body internally by drinking that much. But anyway, this is a pattern that we can have. That Some people say, yeah, it sounds great, right? It sounds fun. And if you're into that... When you're there, you cannot for yourself discern whether it's good or whether it's bad. Because it's just something that you do. And it's something you've always done. Maybe it's something your father's always done. Maybe it's a, uh, what is it called? A family pattern, right? A familial pattern. See, wisdom doesn't speak to us out of the blue. It speaks to us when we need it and when we search for it within the situation that we are in as we learn to listen. To turn to Proverbs 8, we see the way that wisdom is described in the text. And notice the place that wisdom is when she's speaking. Wisdom 8 verse 2 says, At the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand beside the gate and leading into the city. And at the entrance, she cries aloud. And she says, to you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. And there's the key word in verse 6, listen. For I have trustworthy things to say. And I open my lips and I speak what is right. At the highest point in town where the paths meet, beside the gate leading into the city entrance, this is all describing this same space that she happens to be in. The busiest street in town. The crossroads of where everyone gathers together to come into this place. One person selling something, another person is buying something, another person is saying another thing, this person is saying that thing. 
There's so much going on that we can easily miss what she's saying. But in these moments, we need not just to hear, but to listen. Have you ever been in a situation where it just over your head? It was completely swamped. You have no idea what to do. You have no idea what to think. You don't even know what you you're, yourself are thinking. And you hear so-and-so say, you should do it this way, or you should do it that way, or you hear yourself maybe saying to yourself, I should do it this way or this way, or I should think about it this way. Or, and, it, and it just, it's a really busy place to be, isn't it? But there's another voice there. The wisdom of God yearning for your attention. Knowing that we need to stop and take, take a moment back and just listen, God, what, what do you want me to do in this situation? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to progress here? What is the next step? And then not just asking that and going on with your day, but taking the time to listen, to see what he has to say about this. So often in those moments, we breathe a quick prayer, God help me and keep going. And that can be all you can do in some situations. But more often than not, there is a way to step back, even just a minute even just 30 seconds, two minutes, whatever it might be that you have time, just to take a moment and say, this is so important that I'm going to take two minutes away from it so that I can clear my head and pray about it and listen for what God will tell me to do. It's so important to do when we're swamped. When we don't know where to go, we don't know where to turn. And this is the first key to maturity, knowing that I don't know what I'm doing. And when we're in the middle of it, I know when I'm in the middle of a project, uh, recently when I'm in the middle of a project that I'm trying to do quickly, that's way over my head, it's usually setting up sound equipment for our next show because we show up and they say, you have such and such a time before we're there and inevitably we're late or, we, or we're missing a cable and someone has to run back and get it from somewhere. And it can be a very stressful situation when you're there and then all of a sudden things aren't there and things aren't working and you plug it in and there's a weird noise that you can't figure out how to get rid of and just like... How do I do this? This is not working. This is it's just stressing me out. All the guests are coming in and nothing's even ready. And for me, my tendency is to put my head to the grindstone and figure this out, right? Figure out why this isn't working. But I need to take a step back. Clear my head and, and pray. Say, so God, why is this not working? I should know how this works. I know about sound equipment. I know how to plug it all in and it just happens to not be working. So God, guide me. Give me wisdom to know what I need to do in the situation because it's just over my head. And that is one example that I'm sure not every one of us deals with every day, but we all have examples of things like that that we deal with. Ways in which we can learn. Proverbs 9, if you want to jump a chapter ahead just briefly... In verse 4, <clears throat> it says, You that are simple, turn in here to those who, se who without sense, she says, come eat of my bread and drink of my wine that I've mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. So come, sit at my table and listen for a while. There's all sorts of other tables you go to, all sorts of other vendors in this busy street. But come for a time and sit at my table. It's always here, always prepared, always ready. All you have to do is come and listen. Wisdom, shall we say, has this perpetual dinner invitation for us, but so often we have better things to do or we're too busy to go. And what are we too busy doing? Those very things that, in fact, we need the wisdom to be able to do well. See, as we seek to live well and to thrive in this life, we need to be seeking out wisdom, wisdom outside of ourselves. Seeking your own wisdom is a way of boosting up your own pride. Or maybe it's a way of kicking yourself for not knowing what you feel like you should know. See, how we live, what we do or what we think or how we sin or how we don't sin is closely related to wisdom. 
whether we know it's something we should get involved in before we get involved in, in it. Whether we know it's something we should say before we say it. How do you know that? You can't know that yourself. Even if you're the, the, the uh, shall we say, the most oh, well-meaning person, even if you know all about everyone in town, as we know, there's always someone you can offend by something you say or something you do. And the only way to know best how to work in that situation is to listen to God and say, God, you know this person's heart. You know if they're being grumpy today. You know if they're having a good day. You know this person. I don't even know who just walked in the door. How should I wrestle with this situation? It doesn't have to be a situation that's swamping us. It can be any situation. The table is always set and ready. Turn to Ephesians 5 before we close here. We'll be looking at verse 15. And this is sort of where it comes down to the, uh, where the rubber meets the road, right? We were talking about wisdom in general. But this, this verse sort of brings it home and ties it in with how we live, with how we walk, with what we do, with the topic we've been talking about, which is sin. Verse 15 of Ephesians 5 says, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Notice what it says here. It says, how we live. Be careful how we live. And then it doesn't go off and give a bunch of actions we should be doing or actions we shouldn't be doing or be careful how you live. Like some other passages talk about this and they say these are the, th you know, uh, the things you shouldn't generally be involved in, uh, sexual immorality, uh, debauchery, and the list goes on. But instead it says be careful how you live. Not as unwise people but as wise people. So there is some intense connection between these things. That the way we live is closely tied with how much wisdom we have. And not how much wisdom we have about ourselves, but how much wisdom we are accessing. How much we are listening to the wisdom of God. How much we are in intentionally doing that. Wisdom is the desire or the openness to learn, to realize that we don't know anything. And so what would be unwisdom? The unwise people this is talking about. Unwisdom is this idea that we know everything and we don't need anyone else to help us learn. And that, in a word, we could call pride. And in my estimation, this is the root cause of the fall in the garden. That when the serpent came and tempted Adam and Eve and said, you can be like God, how did he describe it? Knowing good from evil. All by yourself. No one else's help. All you got to do is take this fruit, eat it, and you'll know everything. And they look at that and go, that sounds incredible. And how many times do we do the same thing today? We look at a situation, we look at something, and, and we say, that sounds incredible it's just to know everything and not have to go anywhere for any help. And yet I find the more we know, the easier it is to be proud about those things that we know. And we say, I can be like God in this area, so I don't need him. I won't think about going to him. I won't think about praying to him. I'm, I'm here. And that's all I need. And it says, the days are evil. The verse, the days are evil. This is why we seek out wisdom. Because the natural way of the world is the unwise way. The way of sort of stewing in our immaturity, not wanting to progress any further, being okay with who I am or with what I do or with how I feel. Even though there might be a better way. We just aren't wise enough to seek it out or even consider it. And how many times have you sort of tried to help someone who has this attitude of heart, right? or you recognize a pattern in their life, or you see something and you just want to encourage them to be better than that, or to find a way to work, or say, I, I recognize this area of your life might be challenging, and they look at you like you're talking Swahili or something. Right? They say, what, 
this isn't a problem with me. This is the way I am. And now they're offended that you're saying something about them that is perfectly fine, right? I'm sure all of us have dealt with this in one area or another. And we've talked a lot about our role in that and how to say things in a way that is as unoffensive as possible. That is sort of the way we uh, should respond to these things. But the other side of the coin is sometimes people can be offended when they really shouldn't be offended, right? Sometimes there really are things that we need to work on. And in our own lives, we can be offended. Someone says, I noticed such and such and whatever, and you go, oh, you're judging me, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. But here's the question. If someone is judging you or not judging you, is what they're saying invalid? The fact that they're judging you, that's between them and God. That's for them to work on. But what you need to work on is maybe what they're talking about. Because maybe they have actually noticed a pattern in your life that could improve, that could change, that could help you to flourish. And the fact that you took offense to that drew you away from what they were actually saying. Say, well, that person is just crazy and they want to judge everyone. Well, that might be the case. And the immature response would be to not listen to that wisdom and carry on doing or saying what you were doing, right? I find the most judgmental people are often the people who you need to listen to the most, unfortunately, because they're hard to listen to, right? Because they notice things and they say it right away. And maybe the tact they're using either could, could use some improvement, but they're saying things that they've noticed that could be better, right? And so you have to weed through that in your own heart and go, yeah, I'm offended by what they said, but, but maybe there's some truth to what they were trying to say. Maybe there's some wisdom that I can learn from this person. And that's the mature response. I mean, this is what, uh, shall we say, a good politician does all the time, right? When you hear all the complaints from all the people and you weed through all that mess and you figure out what is the core issue that we need to address. How should I respond to these guys with these picket signs or whatever the situation might be? Should I go out and be offended that they're even here and try and drive them off my lawn? That would be a very immature response. Or maybe the mature response would be to, how can I deal with this well? Even if the, the way they're approaching it is probably not the best way, how do I deal with it? How do I listen to what they're saying and take it to heart and do something about it? And walk with that. To close this verse down, um, in verse 18, we see this. Do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. As you sing praises and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks to God the Father at all times for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you've heard the first half of this verse about how alcohol is evil and you shouldn't drink it. You know, don't be drunk with wine. It's debauchery. But that's completely taken out of context, isn't it? I mean, we've been walking through this passage. It hasn't mentioned alcohol or sins at all. It simply mentioned how to be wise. How to be wise. This is a contrast. You remember a while ago, I used this exact example. I was talking about being drunk and how this is a way that people can live, a thing that people can get involved in. And it was an example that I was using to help make a point. Right? And it's the same thing the person is doing here. Here's an example. Don't get drunk with wine. It's debauchery. That's not one way to do it. But instead, be filled with the Spirit. That's what we're talking about. That's the core message. Be filled with the Spirit. Because there really are two ways to deal with something, aren't there? To be drunk with wine and to forget about that it even happened and just to move on and just, you know, shove it down and to not deal with it. Or to get drunk with the Spirit. Be filled with the wisdom of the Spirit and know this is a thing I need to deal with and I need to deal with it well and I don't know how to deal with it well. So instead of saying, it's too hard for me to deal with, I'm going to ignore it or, or drown it. Instead, God help me deal with this because I really don't know what I'm doing here. I really don't know how to do this well. So I want to be so filled with the Spirit that you know what to do and you will work through me and teach me how to do this well. This is the wise way to walk. Knowing that even if I don't know what I'm doing, 
or don't know how to do it, or even if I feel completely alone or lost in the situation I'm dealing with, that God knows what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say, where to go. Maturity doesn't happen overnight. And we're all at different stages in this, in various areas of our spirituality, in various areas of everything in our life. Maturity is owning up to our lostness in whatever situation we happen to be in and letting God find us there and lead us and following him. It sounds simple. It's like, this is all you do. You admit you don't know anything, step one. Then you, you turn to God and let him speak to you, and then you do what he says. It sounds simple, and yet, as they say, it's easy to say and it's hard to do, right? It's incredibly hard to do. But as we do this, we grow. And as we do this, and as we see it out to the end, we realize and we look back, man, it's incredible what God did in this situation. All because I listened. And I didn't want to, and it didn't sound right, and it didn't feel right, and I thought I, thought I knew better, but you know what? God actually did know better. Amazing. So I don't know what situations each one of us in this room are dealing with currently, have dealt with, are about to deal with, but I pray that we deal with it in a mature way. That we remember just to take a step back and say, God help. God help. And then listen to what he says.